Well, hello there, and welcome to the Chinwag Podcast. I am your host, Paul Giamatti, and allow me to introduce Herr Dr. Stephen <laughs> Ozma. <laughs> Herr Professor. Um, Herr Professor. Good to see you, Paul, and uh, great always to be with a pleasure. you. As, as always. always a pleasure to see you. Things are... Uh, Things are going well for you these days. Everything okay? Yes. You relaxed. Uh, you life, feeling good? Life is good. I can't complain. Yeah. Uh, I'm in a good place. Um, good. And so I see you doing. I see you doing your art a lot. You going? You're doing a lot of work on your. Uh, Steve painting. is an artist. Is a wonderful artist. You do a lot of painting. Thank you, sir. I paint and draw, yeah. and it's very therapeutic. And I know you are. You draw as well. And we've actually included a little bit of our artwork in the animations. That's true. And we need actually, to do yes. more of that. I would like to see we do more need of your to do drawings. More of it. I don't know. I I am so amazed at your 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 dedication and how prolific you are. You churn, you you do a painting like every freaking yeah, day. Yeah, I, if I like, didn't, I I'd understand. be a drunk. I, it's like the only thing keeping me from, from water play. You could do both, Steve. It's not, you know, there's That's a lot true. of precedent for people doing both That's good in, point. In, in history. Absolutely, some of the best were probably drunks. Uh, maybe Steve. I'll, I'll give that yeah, a whirl. Yeah, hey, give it a thought. Just think about it. Paul well, ruined indeed. my life. <laughs> no, indeed, indeed. Welcome back to uh, to the show. Uh, we, soon you'll hear we will embark on a discussion of a, a, a topic that I insisted on us talking about, which is the hollow Earth theory. The ho the the theory that we we either are living in or that there are other peoples living in the interior of the Earth. It's that the Earth is amazing. a hollow ball, and it's a crazy theory. Uh, but before that, uh, allow me to invite you to visit uh, Apple Podcasts uh, or, or any various uh, platforms to leave us ratings and comments uh, and questions. Comments, yes. Yeah, give uh, us questions. Uh, if you're if you're Please. a fan of the show, uh, the Hollow Earth, you're in for a in for a penny. That might, in for end, a pound. That might <laughs> end your fandom. That, that might be it for you. This may be no, this may be where you get off your allegiance yeah, okay, to the show. Good. But let us know. Just let us know what you think of what's going on. Um, and TikTok it's to and hear Instagram, from you. Yes. we're on all everything. That stuff. Yes, yeah. we're on the TikTok, which amazes me. The TikTok that makes me feel like I'm a genuine 21st century. Yeah, you're somebody. 21st century schizoid man. That's me. I've made it finally to the top. Uh, indeed, we are going to be discussing uh, one of my favorite pet wackadoodle theories: the Hollow Earth, a kind of archetypal theory of the Chthonic world. <laughs> oh, very which is, good. That's a good word, yes. right? I mean, of means, the earth. That's right, of the earth, the chthonic world uh, at the center of our planet. Uh, and join us now as we discuss and learn the and learn earth. new words <laughs> and learn new words and, and, and up your vocabulary for your SAT test, kids. Exactly. I should point out that everybody's indulging me by discussing this particular topic that we're going to embark on today. And I appreciate everybody's <laughs> indulgence because it is a definitely marginal and very esoteric topic that I am particularly interested. But there's a reason. There's lots of reasons I find it interesting, okay. as as we will discover as we go along. You You did tell me about it like maybe a year ago. I was like, have you heard of the hollow earth theory? And I was like, no. And then I thought, well, that, that's that got to be a tiny little <laughs> – well, it turns out when you start looking into no. it, it's this huge no. thing. So yes. I'm going to ask you – I'm going to ask you how you first got into this. But first, I mm -hmm. just want to tell listeners that this is the idea that the inside of the earth is actually empty of like magma and core. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. in fact some kind of environment – and it's a, that yes. things are living in it, possibly, and yes. maybe even we're living in it. So yes, so yes. how did you get it interested? It is the in hollow this? earth, the hollow earth theory that the or that the planet is hollow, that there's nothing at the, in the center of the planet. And it's getting bigger and it now. Also, it's getting it's, bigger now. Listen, it shades. It, well, that's interesting too. It shades into the idea that there are people and races and stuff that just live under the earth too. It all kind of falls under the same thing, but it's the hollow earth. And I mean, how did I get interested? I, I've been interested in it since I was a child because of Journey to the Center of the Earth. Ah, classic. And, which is one of the like, which is one of the great science fiction novels. And it's, and it's is Jules that, that's Verne. That's Jules Verne, okay. It's Jules Verne. So it's a basic, really wonderful science fiction novel that's a very baseline science fiction novel 
about this expedition that goes in the center of the earth and discovers that there's dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures still living in there. And there's movies about this too. There's a lot, a lot of movies been made about it, right? Or a few. Yes. Well, that's, yeah, they definitely have made movies of Journey to the Center of the Earth too. And it's, but it's, it's, so it was things like that that got me interested. And for some reason, again, what we talk about all the time here is imagination. Like what something about it is very sparky to it my is. imagination. And it's clearly very sparky to a lot of people's yeah. imagination because it does go way back is one of the interesting things. And in fact, hell is an idea that there's something in the earth. Yeah. And a lot of like, yeah, and a lot of, traditional ideas about hell is that there's something in the earth. And there's lots of myths from around the world going way back of passages into the earth, of people living in the earth. There are Indian myths and legends, I should say native indigenous uh, myths and legends about the fact that actually humanity was created inside the earth, oh. like a womb, oh. as if it was a womb. And that actually it was supernatural beings that brought man out of the earth. Really? And they became mankind. There's a lot of these myths. And it all, and a lot of it ties back in the very obvious kind of Mother Earth stuff yeah, yeah. and womb stuff and stuff like that. But it has roots, genuine roots in a lot of mythology. Yeah, I mean, and there are like obvious reasons why you might formulate something like this. There's volcanoes and fissures in the earth and sometimes caves. Yes. So you could imagine as people were developing culture, they're like, what the fuck is down here? <laughs> totally. Know? And there are and there are lots of places around the world. There in Italy, I've seen some of the places where I think you've even seen these places. There are caves that people speculated in ancient times and then in the, even in the Renaissance and stuff like that were entryways into the earth. Exactly. Were entryways into hell and stuff like that. And a lot of the time they were caves that were connected to sort of swamps and very kind of like eerie, creepy places. And people speculated that this was a way to get into the center of the earth. Yeah, and there's and like, like uh, I think it, it wasn't that long ago that people in the West learned about a gigantic cave. I think it's in Vietnam or Southeast Asia where it's almost like a totally different climate inside this cave. It's just goes yes. for like miles. And that's the kind of thing that l lends credence to the idea that there might be a hollow earth, certainly before maybe the 1920s or something. And I think for <laughs> me, actually, a lot of the interest I have in this, and we were just talking about this, is that I actually have a kind of, I think I'm actually claustrophilic. I enjoy oh. caves and things and underground and being underground. In fact, I always want to go spelunking. spelunking. I've never been spelunking, <laughs> which is cave spelunking. exploring. I would love to go spelunking. And I have no problem with sort of going down, down, down. I don't know if you've ever been in anything like that. Have you ever I've been, been in, in like those? I've been in larger caves, but I will never crawl through anything because I am claustrophobic. Right. You're claustrophilic, right. I'm claustrophobic. Right. I will crawl through nothing. No. Yeah, and they, and you can get into these very narrow yeah, fissures no and stuff like way. that. But it looks really cool to me. I had one uh, one time I was in Ireland and went into these caves incredibly deep, and I had probably the one besides uh, one time I had that genuinely claustrophobic feeling was I was you were walking through these corridors and it was like a tourist thing. People were leading you through these things, but I did have that moment of going. Holy fuck! There's probably about a half a mile of rock right over my head right now, and if the whole and it wasn't even so much that I'm in, it's just that there's fucking there's all this shit above yeah. me that's going to collapse. That's on creepy me and crush me. It's super creepy. Well, there are guys who you know my, think about miners. That's their job is to go way down into the earth. Totally, and they live their life down there. It's crazy. But again, and there you go. And here's where a lot of this stuff ties back again: is that there's all these myths of. Dwarves, trolls, yeah, all creatures. these things that live in the mountains and mine down into the earth. And there's all of this like folklore, tons of it. And we're we're gonna get to eventually the more recent theories, which is that you know, even UFOs are involved, maybe the Nazis, totally. <laughs> all totally. kinds of stuff. But let's start like at the beginning because um, one of the things that is really cool is that this guy- I love, by the way, I love the fact that you're interviewing me about the hollow earth theory, <laughs> like I'm some kind of fucking expert on this. You technically are. This makes me so fucking happy. I might be one of the few experts in the, the world- one of the five specialists. Right now, yeah, who knows about this shit. Yes, proceed. Let me just well, you, there's throw a, some questions When I, when I was looking me. it up, I noticed that like, there's some big names associated to this, like Edmund uh, Haley, 
from mm-hmm. Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet. Yeah, he yep. basically believed, or at least he speculated that the Earth might be hollow. Yep. And they believed that uh, even before him in the Renaissance, this guy that we're really into, Athanasius Yeah, Kircher, so I was going to ask you to talk yeah. about him. Yeah, there was a guy named Athanasius Kircher who speculated that the Earth was hollow and it was a system of volcanic vents and stuff like that. But actually his thing was crazier, that there were dragons... <laughs> and all kinds of creatures living in the Earth, and that, like, if rays from other planets would enter the Earth and change base metals into gold yeah, and stuff. Alchemy. It was just completely crazy. Yeah, yeah. Now, but talk about, tell me, talk about who he was, because he's an interesting guy he, to me. Yeah, he's a super cool, like, he's one of these polymaths who did everything. Like, he was trying to translate Chinese into, you know, Italian. He was- And this is when? This, this is, is like, the 1500s, what, what period of time? Basically the 1500s, 1500s, yeah. And he's a German scholar, Athanasius right. Kircher, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And he's like Da Vinci. You know, people know Da Vinci he did math and art and science. Right. And this guy was lesser known <laughs> because uh, he was a little more out there and his shit is more bizarre and strange, but yes. highly recommended. And he- Well, so out there and he was wrong. He was wrong of most time. of the time. Yeah, he was completely wrong most of the time. And one of the things I know he did was that he thought he could translate the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Oh, yeah. Which weren't translated until the the nineteenth century. Yeah, he was. But he thought he had them all figured out, and it was all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and everything was wrong that this guy did. And there's something really fascinating to me about that. About these guys who are so. Was he a bullshitter? I don't know. Yeah, was he a bullshitter, I don't know. or did he actually think he was doing this? Because because people wanted to go to do missionary work in China, China, and he's like, oh, Chinese, let me work on that. Let me tell you what's going on. And, and he's wrong. Yeah, he he's translates like, it. It's all wrong. And it's like, I think that's brilliant. It's amazing. Actually, there was a really funny thing that in doing the research for this, our wonderful uh, Andrew Miller, who did wonderful research yes. for this on this, discovered a really funny thing to me, which is that the word visionary was originally, it, it the original meaning of the word visionary from the 18th century, from the 1700s, was somebody whose imagination was diseased. Oh, no shit. It didn't mean didn't somebody who it. was having this great idea. It meant somebody whose imagination <laughs> was diseased. Like us. <laughs> Yes, it does. But it's people like it's people like this guy Athanasius Kircher who's saying the earth is hollow and it's interesting because it's like it's not what we think of now as a visionary. It's somebody whose imagination's out of control. They they didn't they didn't think of the imagination like we do. They thought like that a lot of the shit in your imagination was real or could create yeah. reality. There wasn't this strict division like we have now. Like facts are here, imagination's there. They didn't, this is all before science. Like, yeah, exactly. This was science. Yeah. This is the early days of science, and so much of it yeah. was just dudes sitting around just winging it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, you're right. It's not bullshitting. It's more no. like um, you're winging it and you have nothing to check your shit against. Like, it's not <laughs> like you can like make a theory. Like he looks down the volcano and he's like, yeah. other creatures live down there. And well, how can we check that? Well, let's look in the Bible. That's you know, yeah, it's exactly. Like, uh, let's look in folklore yeah. and go like, well, other people said there's fucking right. dwarves down there, and that's where dragons live and shit. So I yeah. guess you know, what did Aristotle this weird, say about it? Yeah, yeah. it's this yeah. weird in between thing where you're like, well, I don't fucking know. Maybe <laughs> that works. And it's like, what a great time to be alive in some ways. Totally. And that's my. And the other thing is, we're coming back around to we that. Are. Is what's really freaky is we that are. we're actually coming back around to it. But this is what you're saying. You're right. It's like. Legit scientists like like Haley, whose name's a comet, is saying the Earth is concentric balls yeah. that go in in you know, and it's it's crazy. Yeah, and like it, we're on the outside of the Earth, but inside are a series of concentric other planets inside right. each other, like you know, like right. Russian dolls or something. And then he, they look. And you out. can go from each one to each one, and it's like, and, they, and yeah. in their minds too, it explained gravity a lot of the time. They were saying, well, the motion of these things yeah. inside this thing is causing all this shit to move, and that's yeah. what's causing gravity. You know, so again, they're just winging all this stuff to explain things. And then when when I think it was Haley who looked out, maybe it was the the ne- next guy, Sims, but when they looked out at Saturn and they saw there's a ring around Saturn, this was really cool. They thought the ring is actually just the inner architecture that's left when the outer sphere around Saturn broke away. <laughs> so in their minds, Saturn was a hollow planet yes. and the rest of it blew up and that's what's remaining. Yeah, it's like and a, that kept the thing in place. Yeah, the ring like that girders. you're seeing. That's fucking nuts. <laughs> and it's also really imaginative yeah. is what's kind of great about it. And I think 
again, what's appealing to me about it is how weirdly imaginative it, it is. is. It's really like, but as you say, and, and through time, then there's another guy. The next step of it is this guy, uh, what was his name? Was it uh, Sims? John Sims, yeah, who's another guy. And he had kind of the same idea, but he actually was getting guys interested in taking expeditions yeah. to go find the holes. Let's go find Because his whole thing was you, there were holes at the top and the bottom. Yeah. The and the thing looked holes. like a donut, actually. The planet looked like a fucking donut is what the guy's idea was. And so it was like holes at the top and bottom. And he was getting legit people. He was getting funding. Actually, yeah, he was getting real funding. And people were fucking sailing off to go, I mean, like legit explorers okay, and shit. Okay, when was this? This is like the this 1800s, This is like the early, right? yeah, early, 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 early 1800s and shit like that. And, and he was getting real like attention from people. That was an age of exploration, if you think about it. That's when a lot yeah. of shit really was happening. You're trying to get around the Cape of Good Hope and the Cape, you know. Oh, yeah, but now they've now they've actually gotten further than that at this point. I mean, they know that the world's more known, but not known enough that yeah. some motherfucker doesn't think there's a <laughs> hole at the top and the bottom. <laughs> you know what I mean? That is and true. It's, but it's but it's but it was catchy enough that Edgar Allan Poe, who's one of my favorite writers, yeah. wrote a novel, one of the only novels he wrote. Oh, which what is called, it? Called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. And you know, he's oh, a popular writer. No, nobody's fucking heard of it except me, Steve. <laughs> but you've read it. <laughs> but it was a very popular thing that he passed off. He passed it off as an actual account oh, sweet. of a guy who's on a boat and there's a mutiny, and he ends up at the end of the book sailing towards the hole at the North Pole. And it's like that's how popular that's an idea it cool. is that you have Edgar Allan Poe as this popular writer is saying, I buy that there's a fucking yeah, yeah, hole yeah. at the top. And he writes a fake account that people took as real. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's brilliant. You know, it's hey, something else brilliant. though, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about Poe in this setting, but now that you brought him up, he has this great idea. He calls it, uh, you, I'm sure you read this piece. It's called the imp of perversity. And he yeah. says like, there is a kind of belief, there's a kind of person and they will do the thing, whatever it is that you're not supposed to do. Yeah, that's right. And like, yeah, you're yeah. kind of like this a little bit too. Like you, like- I am? Yeah, I am like this. I will just believe the thing that people shouldn't believe. Well, yeah. But, maybe but it's, no, but it, a norm yeah, breaker. It's interesting. Breaker. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because it's a kind of early idea of like, of like a Freudian subconscious yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And it's, and it's this idea that you're the guy who's like, the last thing in the world I should do right now is pull my pants down in public. <laughs> that would be terrible. And so you do it. So you you're do that it. guy who yeah. does that. Yeah, but but I mean, but he's getting at something. Yeah, he is. He's get, you know, and it's like he's getting at this kind of wacky need to do and believe in this the stuff. Unorthodox that's, and yeah. yeah, that's kind of crazy. I mean, it doesn't. It's not so much back then when these guys are first formulating the theory, but now, if you're into hollow earth and think UFOs there, you're definitely an unorthodox thinker. You're out of step right. with the scientific. No, paradigm. and what, and you're right. And what's interesting is that at this point, early on. It's enough. the The world is shady enough. Yeah. Knowledge is crazy enough and and flexible enough that people will buy this yeah, shit. Yeah, totally. Which brings me to the hero of the Hollow Earth the hero. theory, the guy who really takes it to the next level is this guy <laughs> named Cyrus T. <Teague. laughs> Steve, I can't tell you how happy it's making me right now that I've forced everybody to listen to me talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's, it's, I feel an enormous, an incredible sense of power. Talk about the imp of the perverse. I'm making everybody listen to me talk about Cyrus Teed, who was a guy who no who's one's a little, ever heard of. <laughs> it was nobody has ever heard of, but here's the incredible thing. So Cyrus Teed is a little bit later in the 1800s. And he's just some, he's a fucking guy who becomes a kind of, he's a, he, he becomes, he studies to be a doctor, which again, was something you could just fucking do yeah, pretty easily. Really? You could be of like, I'm a, yeah, I'm a doctor, sure. And so, and he becomes a doctor, a surgeon in the Civil War and stuff like that. Oh. So he's out there cutting guys' legs off Holy and shit. stuff like that. Then he goes and he becomes a kind of what we would now kind of call a homeopathic doctor. So he's a little bit of perhaps a quacky doctor, maybe. But he formulates, for some ungodly reason, oh, what happens is he has a vision. And he's visited by a woman who basically in his mind is Mother Earth. She visits him and tells him, 
that we're living in a hollow earth, that the earth is hollow, but we are living in it. Holy that shit. That we are in the hollow that earth. We don't live so on the weird. outside of the hollow earth. He takes it to the next level. We don't live on the outside. We live on the inside. <laughs> Oh, that's and so his weird. whole yes, and he has all these crazy theories about how you can tell this because I don't know you can see an island that's out there, and if you can see it, then it means that it must curve upwards oh my and God. not curve down. Because I mean, really basic stuff that makes no sense. Oh, is this the guy that like sort of shocked himself? Like he was working with electricity, and he kind of had like an ecstatic. Is that when he yes. had this? Okay, yes. that's that guy. Yes, so Holy he has shit. this ecstatic experience, and. But what happens to him is he declares himself the second coming of Christ. He <laughs> says, I'm the second coming of Christ. I am Koresh. He called himself Koresh. Like, like the later, like you have David Koresh kind of? Like David Koresh. He sees himself and he starts a kind of a cult. And it gets genuinely powerful. He runs for president at one oh, point. Does he really? In 1908 and gets a lot of votes. Oh my God. And he starts a whole cult that begins, and it's this utopian socialist thing. And he moves down to Florida and figures Florida, for some reason, is the center of the hollow earth, which makes no sense. But he thinks this <laughs> town in center Florida, of something. and he's going to build this utopian city in Florida. Wow. And this guy becomes pretty fucking well-known, wow. actually. And that's what's funny is we sit here and go, oh, he's a quack. He's, But he was actually a really well-known guy at the time. And he's coming off with this crazy fucking and, idea. And so are they living like, because um, this is the and time the when there, yeah, there's starts communes. A commune. there, there's a lot of communes happening at this time, like 1900, yes. 1910. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he starts a commune. And he starts a commune and it gets a lot of, and it's got a lot of weird quasi-Christian stuff to it. But like new age stuff too. Which again is really interesting because it's like he's taking this traditional stuff and fucking with it. Which when we were talking about Satanism, it's kind of the same thing. It's uh, a little bit like your traditional shit isn't good enough for me. Your yeah. middle class traditional yeah. Christianity is not good enough for me. That's right. I'm smarter than this. I have like a whole other theory. And there is a lot of that stuff happening. That's a very interesting point because a lot of these guys, there's I don't know if this is like an American thing, but they they get a little bit of learning and then they're like, fuck it, I, ha I know enough to fuck like- it. I know, <laughs> right. To, to fucking yeah. improvise yes. through this. And yes. so they'll like, fuck they'll, it. So they'll like quote Plato, but they haven't really studied anything systematically. Not really. They're, they're doing medicine, but they haven't really done a medical degree or anything. Not really, and that was yeah. The, no. And that was the time yeah. too. And you're right. And it does feel like, because a lot of these guys are Americans who start really getting into this. Like a lot of it is Americans and it does seem to be something very American yeah. about it. This kind of, I'm going to, invent this brave new world. You're not the I'm boss of me. This. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're not the <laughs> boss of me. You can't fucking tell me anything. You can't, which is interesting. And that, and again, this is why it interests me. Yeah. Because it gets into this territory of like, I'm going to challenge the established belief system. That's I'm right. I'm going to fucking tell all you to go fuck yourselves <laughs> because I actually know we're living. And he actually thought he proved it with this contraption that he built. <laughs> which I can't remember what the fuck it was oh, called. Oh, he was, was like trying like, to measure the concave. Yeah, it was called the rectilineator or something <laughs> oh, like that. And it was some it was some thing that was like this long wooden shit that he was moving around down in Florida. And somehow he thought he proved that because it was like, well, we bumped into a cliff or something. And it was like, <laughs> clearly it's going upwards. You know what I mean? None of it made yeah, any sense. how would you sense. do that? Like if you had a, if you had like a flat bar, I'm just totally like trying to figure this out. And you were going against a, co a concave surface. <laughs> then yes. maybe the You're edges- You're actually trying to I know, figure like this to, out. The edges yeah. might actually start to bump shit before the center bumps stuff. This is what I'm thinking. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose so. I guess that's the idea. He had all this complicated shit that didn't make any sense because the sun needed to be at the center of this hollow globe that we're inside of. But he had all this crazy theory about, well, there's a reflection <laughs> off the ocean is causing all kinds. I mean, it, but, it, but really elaborate to explain why the sun sort of didn't look like it was there all the time, why it was going down and coming up. I mean, none of it really makes any well, sense, So you were, obviously. you're inside the earth and you're looking mm -hmm. at another side at, and you're seeing shit reflected through the it's, holes. It's also the <laughs> it's also the explanation of why you can't see. Why couldn't you theoretically just take a telescope and look up yeah. and see Malaysia or whatever right, right. from you know from Cape Cod? But it's like, <laughs> well, it's too bright. 
<laughs> Kids, too bright. And then it's also like there's something about the night air gets too clouded and so you can't see. So it's like there's all kinds of explanations for it. And I guess – and people would say to him, okay, all right, let, I'll, I'll grant you that we live inside of a hollow fucking sphere. What's outside of it? And he was like, nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And it was he didn't like he even had speculate. No, no, he didn't even have any speculation for it. But I think too, it's like it's this kind of for the for a religious guy like this too. It's this idea that the whole thing is enclosed. There isn't this thing we can't understand. The whole system, God created this enclosed ah, system, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it all makes sense in here. It's all enclosed inside this ball, and we can understand everything because it's not infinite it's not you know because he couldn't deal with the idea that's like that was beginning people were beginning yeah. to say well it's this it's, is when it's physics endless. and astronomy yeah is really it's taken potentially off. Yeah. endless and stuff he's going uh -uh, no 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 it's, <laughs> it's all it's, it's a, all it's contained in here eden. it is a garden of eden and it's like and we're all and we have control over it and we've got you know, like that's a very interesting point that i hadn't think about because if you look at it in the context of what's happening in the rest of the world the universe is getting bigger and bigger. Einstein is theorizing in the early 1900s. Right. You're getting, eventually you're getting shit like quantum mechanics. We're thinking like the universe is vast. If not infinite, it's expanding. And then along comes a response, which is no, it's this small, tight, understandable right. garden of you're Eden wrong. still. Yeah. Yeah, you're wrong. It's actually very understandable. We're safe, we're safe in yeah, here. Yeah, we're safe. We're safe. It's not this crazy shit we can't understand. Don't give me this shit. <laughs> but the other thing that's interesting is that it's like we think now – with the internet that these things became very widespread, you know, every crazy shit like this becomes, but it was getting, it was pretty widespread then too, actually. Uh, it's like, like I say, this guy ran for president. That's against incredible. Teddy Roosevelt and somebody else. And, and he was on the democratic ticket and he got a lot of votes. He actually did. He created a political party. Was he? He must have been charismatic. Yes. He was apparently very charismatic. Yeah. He had this culty thing and, and it, and, it, and this is the other thing that starts to get interesting to me about this is that it's – and it actually – when you go back in time when we were talking about how it started out and there was lots of stuff about like different races being brought out of the earth and stuff like that, he gets a little bit into this weirdness of – race stuff starts oh. coming out of this. And there's like superior races, inferior oh. races, even though he started positing equality of the races. Yeah, not exactly. Not exactly. He was also a eugenicist. Yeah. And he, and he started positing equality of the sexes, but yeah, not really. Women need to be celibate until I tell them not to be oh. and stuff like that. So it was this weird thing that starts getting into that. But it's another theme that starts coming out of this stuff as it goes along. And actually we skipped over Sorry to confuse the issue, but we skipped over the theosophists who are up around the same oh, that's time. that's right, around the same time. You have these people in Europe who are also having this new occult religion and they're taking lots of- Like Madame this woman, Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky and yeah. these other people. And she's a sort of spiritualist who yeah. talks to ghosts and seances and they're creating this whole very pile. And one of their big myths is a, a lot of stuff about a superior race oh. that comes out of the earth. Oh. That actually lives in the earth and lives in places like Mount Shasta no shit. and stuff like that, and lives in Tibet and lives in these underground oh, caverns or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and all of this stuff. And so they start this whole idea of like wisdom comes from these secret enclaves, these secret masters uh -huh. that live in all these weird places, and and that stuff starts combining with the hollow earth stuff. And you start getting this weird racial shit yeah. starts going on. And that, and Madame Blavatsky and all those theosophists start positing there's this white race and there's this darker race and there's all these different races and the Atlanteans and the people from yeah. Atlantis and all this shit. But a lot of it centers around some hollow earth stuff, oh, that's which amazing. is really interesting. So it's, so a lot of this stuff is, is generated by a hollow earth thing. A lot of things that become, classic aspects of a lot of kooky fucking <laughs> quasi-esoteric shit that starts to leak into the 20th century. A lot of it's coming, and this is, again, why I think it's interesting. It is. Is that, is that it actually has a lot of elements that become part of a lot of crazy shit. The Nazis. Gotta always bring the fucking Nazis the in. Nazis are the involved. Nazis get obsessed with it, with the idea of a hollow earth. Because they like this idea of like a primordial human, yes. uh, like Aryan type or something that totally. comes from the earth 
the, the, totally. the folk or the folk movement or whatever. Yeah, totally. And there's all this crazy shit that happens with the Nazis start saying there's holes at the top and bottom. They're sending guys out to do expeditions. I think at some point there's some crazy idea Hitler's still alive. So you start getting this race stuff. Yep. You start getting all of this kind of like weird shit like this starts centering around this hollow earth stuff. It's a way that people like, we, we're doing it now. Every age does it. You use a little bit of science, a little folklore, a little religion, and then you try to make sense out of your current social strife. Yes. You know, what's, yes. you know, history's like this and, and theorizing is like this. And so, yeah, you can imagine like people are, this is like around, like you said, 1900. It's mm -hmm. before the first world war. Like people are smarter than they've ever been in some sense. But also, like you said, we've never been to the North Pole or the so South Pole at that time. Not really. Not till the no. 20s. And even then and it's arguable. No, and then even, yeah, but even then you have guys like, legit guys like Admiral Byrd, who's yes. the guy who's going to the North Pole. He's not entirely sure he doesn't believe it. Okay. I mean, he's, Wait, let's he's let's quasi- Let's introduce who Admiral Byrd is. So well, Byrd, yeah. Byrd is a guy who's, so this is like the next, after Teed, <laughs> There's no after Teed, really, but <laughs> after, Teed, after Teed is after, after Cyrus <laughs> Teed. Yeah. Uh, Admiral uh -huh. Byrd is this guy who was a very well respected and decorated aviator who basically flew in World War I and then eventually in World War II. But in between there, he was tasked with actually flying. He, he was trying to compete with Lindbergh and do the transatlantic flight. Right. Lindbergh beat him at that, but then they commissioned him to fly to the North Pole, which he yep. did. There's some debate about whether he actually made it or not, but let's set that aside. Um, and then after that, he was tasked with going to Antarctica to see to do the same thing, check out the poll. But it was, like you said, they were worried about are the Nazis or or the Japanese or anybody trying to settle the poles as a kind of military base. We better nip yeah. that in the bud somehow. So yep. he starts yep. doing those flights. And that stuff feeds into this whole idea that the Nazis have the Nazis are building secret weapons in these caves. That's what they're theorizing. In the, fucking, yeah. in the earth. It's like, well, and then then it but then the Nazis start going, maybe we should do that. I mean, and so they start, you know, I mean, so it's all feeding into each other. Here's another element I'm gonna introduce into this that's very interesting to me, and one of the reasons I find it interesting. You're following this, oh, right? Yes, Steve? I'm, following? I'm following it. <laughs> it's like clear as mud. But yes. here's another here's another part of it that's interesting. Well, it is. It's just this chaos of crazy theories, but it all, a lot of it There's keeps patterns. coming yeah. back to this. It keeps coming back to this thing. Like I say, the whole Mount Shasta thing. Mount Shasta is this mountain in, in central, north central California that supposedly, and you know, you know, the whole thing about Mount Shasta is that this lost continent crashed into California back in the, you know, Stone Age, and these super beings jumped into Mount Shasta <laughs> as that thing. And that's, and that's, and so Mount Shasta's got, and they live underground. Is that what under Bigfoot is? God damn it. That's what Bigfoot and then, is. And actually, it does, it, it does leak into the Bigfoot <laughs> thing. There are people who think Bigfoot is a race that comes from underground. So it's like, it can, it, yeah, everybody can tie. Yeah, the cryptid yeah. thing So you is can important. tie everything together with this. But here's the other element I want to introduce. And this is that in the 40s, kind of early 40s, a guy named Richard Shaver, who's a very mysterious figure in the world, begins writing these kind of wacky, pulpy science fiction stories that get published in these pulpy science fiction magazines by this guy who, by this guy named Ray Palmer, who figures this stuff is so wacky. And he starts selling tons of magazines because these stories are incredibly wacky. Pulp, pulp fiction. And it's this, and it's this elaborate story about an alien race that comes to earth and they live underground because they can't deal with the sunlight and they build all these machines in the center of the earth and they create us and they create this other race of crazy monsters and we eventually make our way out to live on the surface of the earth these superior beings and if you're following yeah, this, oh yeah <laughs> can't stand these superior titan beings can't stand being there so they leave and they leave all of their crazy machinery and their evil creatures in the center of the earth wow and ufos death rays all of these kind of classic tropes of wacky, pulpy science fiction Are come out of this guy's story. And this guy writes these stories for decades. Wait, when, when is he writing? In the, in the, the 40s? The interesting thing is he writes all of this stuff before the UFO flap starts. Oh. Before the real UFO craze starts in 1947, 
This guy with that famous Kenneth Arnold sighting is the first big UFO sighting in 1947. This guy's writing this shit before then, in the early 40s. Wow. And it's all this stuff about UFOs, flying saucers. He introduces this idea of flying saucers and all kinds of classic crazy stuff. And it's all the hollow earth. It's all because these monsters living in the hollow earth are flying their machines out to fuck with us. That's amazing. And over time, as he keeps writing, he connects it to Hitler. He says these evil creatures are controlling Hitler. They're <laughs> controlling all the bad shit that happens. This guy connects it to the hollow earth thing. But he starts talking about the Kennedy assassination and all this stuff. And so again, it's a basic, weird Focal a point mailgum. for a lot of crazy yeah. fucking theories. All the way up to Charles fucking Manson. Well, how's Manson Charles connected? Charles Manson <laughs> believed that the earth was hollow. Come on. Helter Skelter, Charles Manson, who was the great sort of dark figure of the Aquarian age and all the stuff of the hippie movement. We know Charles, we all know Charles who Manson indirectly is. caused the murder of- Caused uh, the murder of, of, care, you know, um, de- of a number of people. Yeah, a number of people. He's got a cult-like following. One of the things he believes is that there's going to be a race war. Helter Skelter yes. is going to be this race war. Influenced by and a Beatles song. Go on. Yes, and <laughs> he's going he's gonna to instigate this race war. And again, race coming into it. He's going to instigate this race war, and and he and his followers are going to hide in the earth because no he, shit. in his whacked out way, was out in the desert with some guy, and there's some famous cave in Nevada called like the Devil's Hole or something, and he was like, <laughs> that leads into the center of the earth, and when the race war comes, we're going to go live in the center I of the earth. I never knew that. Never heard that No, I'm not a people don't, no. but it's like, but this idea- keeps popping yeah. up in all of these like kind of really important things if if you're if you think crazy wacky conspiracy theory esoteric shit is important which I do because I think it's a kind of shadow history of human human consciousness a shadow you know history I mean? that's a good way to put yeah, it yeah so it's a kind of thread that goes through a lot yeah, of this yeah. shit is the hollow earth it covers ufo's it covers all of this stuff isn't that interesting I, i'm f- fascinated by I that i hope you find it interesting i Steve. do I <laughs> But it's just going all the way through human from from these ancient legends to Charles Manson. I think people uh, assume that I think that a lot of science fiction and a lot of the narratives that you've been talking about, like they associate it with space. And there's good reason sure. for that. We had a space program. Absolutely. Space sure. is the place, uh, as Sun Ra would say. But what sure. you're talking about is like a, this shadow history, which is that there's a kind of mysterious cryptid and secret history way of thinking about the interior spaces of yeah. the earth. Stuff's and coming from well inside. Known. Yeah. No, it's not as well known, but it actually has a lot to do with a lot of shit that comes up. I mean, one thing, one way to look at it is like, it's, it, it's a tradition that feeds on itself because you learn it through these novels and through these stories and then you- Yeah, prof- and there were a you- lot of stories written about it. Yeah, and there's a lot of like popular pulpy fiction. The guy who wrote the Tarzan stories, oh. who invented Tarzan, invents a whole hollow earth thing and writes a bunch of novels about the hollow earth. Wait, who is Tarzan? Uh, that's not H.G. Wells. Who's uh, No, the guy's name is Edgar Rice yeah, Burroughs. Yeah, Edgar H.G. Wells. Wells. H.G. Wells wrote about a hollow- yeah, the hollow earth. Yeah. The earth is hollow. He also wrote about the moon being hollow. That's a whole other oh, man. conspiracy theory. We need another which is there. episode for well, that. Well, there's a whole oh. other, yeah, we need another episode for the fact that the there's people moon. who think, well, there are people who think the moon is hollow and there's people who think the moon is a spaceship and there's people who think that the moon is not real and that the moon is also hollow. We don't need to get into that, but but there are people who think the moon is hollow. But But it's interesting. Again, this idea that these things have to be you know, artificial or something. I want to talk too. a little bit more about the, the uh, Admiral Byrd case because there's, like, I, what I like about this stuff, I think it's what you like too, is I like to entertain a theory or an idea without necessarily endorsing it. So my, yeah. my view here is not like, let's go back to the hollow word theory. But yes. I like I like you, uh, the minutia of it is fascinating. And one of the things Bird is is thought to have said, although apparently this supposed secret diary of his is apocryphal. Like, it does not exist as far as we know. Right, he wrote a diary yeah. about how the earth was but hollow. It, it right. appears to have been the invention of some writers in the 60s. Anyway, 
in it, the, he, what he says is he, he's flying over Antarctica. He sees these green pastures and goes down there and he sees crafts and weapons that have swastikas on them. This is what right. the secret diary says. And then yeah. he meets someone called the master and the, ma- right. the master tells him, you fucking guys with your nuclear uh, weaponry, you can't be trusted. We need to police you. And it's sort of like the Gort idea that humans- like the day the earth stood yeah, still, like the day which the is earth this stood famous still, yeah. science fiction movie where the where aliens come down and tell us we right. we can't handle, they need to monitor us because we can't handle our power, exactly. our atomic power at that point. Yeah, so it's the same thing. I like this because it shows you an anxiety that the culture is having at this time, yes. which is yes. we just dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan. That's this right. shit could end the world. That's and right. you see people trying to figure out how could this be stopped if each superpower, you know, has the power to do this. And you think about like, well, maybe there's another race of creatures, yes. maybe a smarter alien that can rein us in. I find that fascinating. Super fascinating. And all this stuff ties into that stuff. It's fa- and, and I guess now it's sort of back a little bit. Yes. You were just telling me, and, yeah. I, and, and I saw from the research that was done that there are some, some people, it's coming back a little. Totally. Bit. Like now there's pictures that purport to be what Admiral Byrd saw inside the hollow earth. And yet, of course, we we're discovering that these are created largely by AI, like mm-hmm. things like Dali and, you know, the open AI. Yeah. And so they're making these images that look totally convincing, and then they're going around the... And this is a really interesting point, too, is I worked for a while to find out whether there was an Admiral Byrd diary. I had a reason... And I have a PhD, and I do research <laughs> for a living, and it took me forever to fucking... To find out if that. it was real or not. But everywhere I looked was Admiral Byrd's secret diary. And so yeah. this is sort of an interesting thing, because now we have AI making these images... And yeah. people are like, well, fuck it. There is a hollow earth. The Nazis are still there. This stuff goes deep. Yeah. This stuff takes, th- these these crazy theories take deep root, man. And people will return to them yes. again and again. And it is interesting because I suppose people are beginning to subscribe to it again. And it's funny because it's a little bit like <laughs> you, you look around the marketplace of crazy ideas and you're like, too many people are believing that crazy thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, nobody's nobody's talked about this fucking crazy thing in a long time. The imp you know of perversity. Yeah, yeah, you know, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know what? I'm bringing this back. I'm going to bring the hollow earth back. Enough with your flat earth, which is a whole other topic. And your fake Enough moon your, landing. Let's go yeah, to the hollow earth. Enough with your earth. fake moon landing. Let's bring this thing back. Yeah, and it's like, it's really interesting. Then you're an elite of like... Of conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theorists among yeah. conspiracy theorists. But like, this is an interesting thing. I was just, what you just said is interesting. You're the elite of like your knowledge is your is the most advanced. You've got the most elite knowledge now, and that's a really interesting part of this. I was thinking about how, for some reason, this got me just a little bit of a left turn, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. It's, it's a, a chinwag. I know, but it's a whole other episode's <laughs> worth of conversation. But I think about the Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare thing. Oh, that theory is there. Yeah, it's always so interesting to me because one of the, which started in the 19th century, this idea of Shakespeare, somebody else must have written Shakespeare because he was this uneducated rube from the country who like, you know, he was this fucking bumpkin and how the hell did he know all this stuff and how could he have written this? And that's the basic thing. We don't know much about Not the dominant view, by the way. That's the the unorthodox (laughs) view. No, no, this is, it's an unorthodox view. And now it's super popular again now. There's a lot of books being written about it. Yes, it is. And throughout time when it started, there have been very like, Mark Twain believed it. Like, you know, even now there's a lot of like, very, you know, the the actor Derek Jacobi and the actor Mark Rylance actually believe it. Are you serious? And it's like, yes, there's very legit wow. people who believe this. But what's interesting about this theory is that the basic idea is it's it's a it's these independent scholars, these kinds of guys we're talking about, who go, there's this elitist establishment that's telling me what to believe about this. And it's clearly bullshit. And there's this elitist yes. academic establishment. Yes. There's this authority that's telling me this is bullshit and I can do my own research and I can figure this out. But the ironic thing with these guys is that their theory is the bumpkin couldn't have written it. It had to be an elitist aristocrat who wrote it because their theory is this Earl of Oxford wrote it or these highly educated guys. So it's this paradox where they go, 
It couldn't, you know, I'm smarter than you. I know more than you. And in fact, I know enough to know that it actually was the smart guys who did this stuff. So then <laughs> they're actually- paradox. So it's this yeah. completely paradoxical thing of putting yourself, you're always, you're, you're, you become, you become, the elite yeah. all the time. It's you're like the, this the crazy. You're the no You're the no. The people in the know. Yeah. Yeah. It's always this striving to be the guy who knows the and, most. And you see that in contemporary politics too. Like people have theories about whether it's you know about COVID or about politics. People will be like, the official line of the uh, is this, but we have done our own research on the side yes. here, and we know the yeah. truth. We have the totally. real it's information. Elite, you know, do it's your research. Elite knowledge. Kind of yeah. And it, but it even. But you even have to posit a new authority. Yeah. It's what's interesting. It's like, it's funny to me the whole like JFK is still alive, you know. <laughs> JFK is still alive. And it's is like, he in the hollow the, earth? The, the well, probably. The, the you know, the guys in charge, the elites in charge won't tell you that the most elite guy is still alive. Yeah. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, that's hilarious. And we've got the most elite guy. <laughs> and, you know, we have the ultimately elite, the elite of elites. We have JFK. Is still, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's really it's funny. funny. <laughs> Here's a question on this same topic that I was thinking about. Like, you take somebody like uh, – Cyrus Teed or, or like, you know, or somebody like maybe P.T. Barnum's not a good example, but somebody who's no, on, on the edge, yeah. you know, now, like, are they, there seems to me there's three options. One is they think that they have the truth that they've done the research and, and everybody else is wrong. The second is they know that they're wrong and they're cynically charlatans making money. Mm -hmm. And then the third option, it seems to me is that they're somewhere like, they're like, this writer we like, like Jorge Borges, like they're kind of like having a joke. They're having a laugh on everybody. Mm -hmm. Are they putting out information and then just seeing how fucking people will take it up and run with it? Because this guy who yeah. did the AI images, when they finally caught up with him and said, you know, what are these? He said, I made these just to show people how weird and how much disinformation the mm -hmm. new technology can make. So he made it mm -hmm. kind of as a joke. No, that's good. Yeah, that's and that's a good... It's a public service, I suppose, I guess, in some ways. if you catch him. Except if you do, except so many people are, they're not going to, they're not going to believe it. Right. They just, you know, right. they won't believe it. If you show them, yeah, look, I made this up. Here's the alien. I built him out right. of like fiberglass. Well, then you, you, clearly you've been told to say this yeah, kind of thing. exactly. You know what I mean? Clearly somebody is like telling you to say this. So it's an endless game. That You thing. can always but save think, the theory. Yeah, but I think the interesting thing is talking about guys like <laughs> Cyrus Teed and stuff like that is- the, the the harder thing to know is how much of that is he's a he's a flim flam man and how much of it does he really believe yeah. and how much did he start out as a flim flam man and then you start to believe it yeah and it's like and and you know how much a con artist needs to believe their bullshit is a really interesting question that I've had for many years like how much do they actually need to buy into, do you have to start buying into your own bullshit? And do you get that because you're seeing yourself in the eyes of all these adoring devotees? Then, you know what I mean? Like now- Do you start like, to just go, wow, I'm actually yeah. onto something yeah. here. Maybe I'm really onto something. Or you're a, soci or you're a sociopath, which I guess is the same thing. <laughs> you know, or it's like, you know, that that you're out of your fucking mind or something. I was thinking like, you know, you're you're a celebrity. You're not like any other celebrity I I know because you, you, you're very down to earth. But I can imagine if you are celebrity you could It'd start easy. to see yourself as like i am really important you know yes. what i mean like totally absolutely no i'm Steve, I'm sitting here right now going, I'm important <laughs> enough to talk about this shit. Cyrus and people Dean. are gonna yeah, Cyrus Tate and people are gonna listen to me. I mean, I I clearly at some level think I'm 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 worth <laughs> sitting here fucking talking about well, this shit. I think shit. those kinds of uh those kinds of aspirations are humble enough to bring teed into the conversation. <laughs> I think you don't have to worry, your ego's not out of control. I guess so. I guess so. But but it is true. I mean, and I have thought to myself sometimes, yeah, it would be easy to you know, and, and and I think a lot of, you know, the line between that kind of like, I'm this kind of like beloved celebrity and then I'm starting to fuck with people's yeah. minds is probably pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty nebulous. And, and yeah. I guess the, the other thing on this, and maybe this is sort of my last uh, point on, mm -hmm. on the whole meditation is like how the information travels and like, because we now live with memes and we yep. have this technology like TikTok, you can just send a meme or Instagram 
And we are talking about stuff that travels like a meme before, yeah. you know, there were meme before electronic right. media. Right. And it's like word of mouth and stories and stuff. And I think that these kinds of traditions are going to get, I don't know what's going to happen to them because we're living in this new era of electronic transmission where you can send around images and and stories. I, and I was thinking, you know, if if I told my son when he was 10, if I said to him, like, you know, I was in the Rolling Stones for a while. He didn't, he didn't know shit. He's 10. He'd be like, really? That's amazing. And yeah, then, right, and yeah. then if I like, I was thinking if I made a website where I Photoshopped myself with Keith <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it was just in the seventies for a little while. And then I had to go back. Sure. And then like, I forgot about it. And he, like later in life, people were like, me, your dad wasn't in the stones. And then they searched it up and they saw me with Mick yeah. on this website. Yeah. There yeah. would be no way to convince yeah. him that I was not, you know what I mean? Like. Or, or it'd be hard to convince him because you checked it against the internet. Yeah, it's but the a brave internet new is just a of cloud stuff. of bullshit. Yeah, it's a cloud of bullshit, and it's but it's a brave. You're right. It's a brave new world of this stuff. It's a whole like what? It, yeah, where it goes now, I yeah. don't know. Because don't of know. this photographic shit, it's incredible to me that my first impulse a lot of the time when I see an image or something now is to go, "Is that real? Is it yeah. fake?" My first impulse, which is maybe a good thing, but not too. It's like fucking hell. It's too bad that that's our first impulse, but it has, sort of has to be. You yeah. know, anything we see online. Well, I anything else about the hollow earth that you no, felt I mean, we did I just, not I get just to? Think it <laughs> <laughs> oh, God bless it. What a treat this has been for me. What a special outing this has been for me that I can pedal my particular pet wackadoodle thing around. Well, you're going to get some new fans of the hollow you think earth. So? I think so, you yes. think so? Five maybe. at least, maybe six. <laughs> Well, that's good. That's a start. That's a start. That's how Cyrus Teed started. You got to start somewhere. Start somewhere. Chinwag is a production of Treefort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Treefort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Our associate producer is Andrew Miller. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardo. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Treefort. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Audio production, supervision, and editing by Maxwell Carney. Additional audio assistance and mixing by Jeff Neal. With additional production management from Renee Levesque. Clara Wong is Celestial Empress of Benevolent Knowledge. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod.